Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Body Track uh, webinar. Uh, thanks again for attending, everyone. Uh, just remember to keep the uh, mute button on um, so we can continue with this webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the question uh, box down below. I'll be glad to answer them at the end of the night, or you're more than welcome to email Body Track and they can forward them to me and I will answer them um, in the order that they're uh, taken. I uh, really appreciate you guys listening in on this. This will be about a 50 minute to an hour presentation. We're going to be talking, carrying on from what we did last time on cardiovascular performance and weight loss. We're going to be talking about resistance training and nutrition with weight loss and performance goals. Um, we know that Cardiovascular, resistance training, proper nutrition, three top ways that we can really see those performance enhancements, weight loss goals, and trying to reach all those personal goals we want to uh, change and see happen. Uh, we need to hit those three things. So, again, I'm really glad you guys are taking the time to listen. I um, hope you guys learned something today. And, again, we'll continue these things, these webinars, every month. So uh, we'll try to get you as much information out there as possible. Uh, my name is Mike DiBiase. I work for Florida State University. I'm also a registered dietitian. I work in the strength conditioning department. So this is something I'm very passionate about, and I hope you guys take away a few things from this presentation today. We are going to be talking about resistance training, uh, resistance exercises, and the proper nutrition, and looking at performance goals and weight loss at the same time and seeing if how we can uh, get all of these opportunities with us in the resistance training. And I'm just going to put this at full screen, get into the slideshow, and we'll begin. Okay, so uh, resistance training, you know, there have been some previous guidelines. Um, for what resistance training is and how to eat for resistance training. And previously they have been essentially lacking. If you if we look back to what and especially in some of the magazines and some of the non peer reviewed articles and journals that we see and some of just the generic magazines that we see in the uh, grocery stores or in the bookstores, you know, usually they always say the very basic information of eat more protein or eat little to no carbohydrates. Um, you have to eat immediately after your workout or the benefits will be lost and you lose that window of opportunity to consume and utilize those nutrients appropriately. Um, so kind of those absolutes have been changed and we are now finding out that nutritional practices um, much more artistic in nature and individualized are just as essential. Um, saying things like increased training intensity and duration will have to be met with an increased nutrient need. So the harder you work, the longer you work, the better you work, the better your nutrition has to match. Otherwise, performance and goals will not be met. Um, the diet must not just say eat more of this and eat little of this, but now you have to look at the full spectrum of energy demands, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, um, being able to actually get those macronutrients in for energy, and does your body necessarily need all of them or does it need more? Uh, macro and micronutrient needs, micronutrients being some of the minerals and vitamins. Uh, fluid needs, a lot of us don't consume the necessary fluids that we should uh, per day. And the timing, are we actually getting in the proper nutrients at the right time do we know what that time is um, and does the timing of actually consuming food, the proper food, work in our lifestyle? Some of us have jobs where we sit at a desk and we can consume freely food um, without any you know, regard for getting in trouble or missing work. Or some of us, the job is very strenuous and demanding where eating and taking time for ourselves to meet those needs is um, kind of pushed to the back burner. And so we have to figure out how do we come to the middle on these things. The ACSM guidelines, which I do, do just want to go over very quickly with you, um, these are the guidelines that 
ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, utilizes, and every few years they update them. And in 2011, there was an another update in July that a lot of gyms, including Body Track, FSU, Campus Rec, um, the majority, I would say, of reputable fitness areas use the ACSM guidelines as a platform. Now, not all use them as their training methodology, their risk management methodology, but it's a good way to look at across the board what is the essential things that should be done in resistance training and the quality and quantity of exercise. So here are the ACSM guidelines and you can probably imagine that some of you are doing quite more than this which is great. Some of you may um, just be under this and these are some of the areas that we expect people to match to see the, the minimum amount of benefits. Um, adults train each major muscle group two or three days each week, you know, with at least the 24 to 48 hours in between, um, with a variety and uh, of exercises and equipment available to us. Uh, very light, light intensity is best for older persons or previously sedentary adults starting an exercise program. It's good to start off light and slow and then work our way up. Uh, two to four sets of each of those exercises um, help, adults Im help adults improve strength and power. Uh, each exercise, 8 to 12 reps, improve strength and power. 10 to 15 reps, improve strength in middle age and older persons starting to exercise. And 15 to 20 reps, improve muscular endurance, so how long the muscle can actually last. Um, and adults should wait at least 48 hours between resistance training sessions. For some of us, that doesn't really work. We like to potentially work out every day if we haven't already worked that muscle. But if we have worked that muscle, waiting at least 24 to 48 hours is beneficial because in that time, we are supplying those muscles with the nutrients for them to consistently improve, get better, grow if necessary, um, and replenish their needs so we can, again, go another day hopefully a little bit longer, a little bit better, a little bit harder. So again, these are the basic guidelines that ACSM has put out. Some of us aren't meeting them yet, and we would like to see some of those people get to this level. Some of us are, are absolutely blowing through these levels um, and are continuing to go harder and harder, and that's great. So here is, this is taken from the NSCA, National Strength Conditioning Association, from Human Kinetics in 2008. This is the physiological adaptations to resistance training. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can clearly see that um, with resistance training, actually lifting weights, bands, dumbbells, anything with resistance uh, to the muscle fiber, we do see a lot of positive changes. And I'll just go over a few of them that are, that are important to us in this discussion. Muscular strength, I don't think that's... Uh, any way that we can refute that, it absolutely increases muscular strength with resistance training. Um, aerobic power, we have seen in a lot of research that there is either no change, which is fine, so we, we do resistance training and there may not be uh, a significant change in aerobic power, or it actually increases. So it's either doesn't harm or it's better. It makes us better. So resistance training can have a good effect on aerobic power, um, actually pushing through some of those harder aerobic training sessions. Uh, maximal rate of force, being able to push something heavier in a shorter amount of time, push something heavier um, quicker, increases. Um, anaerobic power, of course, increases. Uh, fiber size, so the actual muscle fiber size increases. This does not mean that we necessarily get bulkier men if that's something that uh, men are looking for, they have t t testosterone for that. Women tend to see um, the muscles tighten, tone up, and this is where we encourage more women to actually resistance train because that is also a myth that women will bulk in size with resistance training where that's, it's not really that case just because women don't have the testosterone levels that men do to actually create that bulk fiber size. Um, Mitochondrial density, so kind of the, the powerhouse of each cell, um, the density decreases because mitochondrials, uh, mitochondria are used heavily with aerobic training. Um, so and there may be a, a slight decrease, but that's fine because resistance training, we're working on the fiber size and the fiber strength and the muscle, and the muscle strength. Um, 
but the uh, cytoplasmic density, so where a lot of these anaerobic uh, power is coming from and the energy is being dispersed increases. So the cytoplasmic density is good. If that increases, then we usually see greater changes in musculature as well. Um, if you just look at enzyme activity, you can see a lot of these things uh, increase. Again, these are all benefits to resistance training. Connective tissue may increase with ligament strength, tendon strength. For a lot of us who are, who are getting older, these parts that hold the muscle to bone, bone to bone, you know, these are absolutely necessary uh, for continued movement, change of direction, prevention of injury. So with resistance training comes reduced um, risk of injury as well. Body composition, more and more research is coming out that resistance training does, in fact, um, decrease body fat percentage and increase fat-free mass, essentially muscle. The neural adaptations to resistance training, if we look at the graph, you'll see that it says around six weeks, where you can see as performance going up from the bottom up is an increase, time left to right is an increase in time. You can see that many things are actually happening, many positive things. Strength is going up. Hyper, so strength of the muscle fibers, being able to lift more weight, push harder. Uh, the hypertrophy, so essentially the muscle size and definition, increases with resistance training. The neural adaptations uh, with that, so that means the connection between the brain, the central nervous system to the muscle fiber increases. And if we can increase that neural adaptation, uh, being able to increase the speed, increase the motor units, which are the connections between the central nervous system and the muscle belly, the muscle fiber itself, being able to actually increase the number of those recruited to do a lift, we can lift harder, we can lift longer, we actually potentially reduce the risk of injury because we don't have to forcibly do things. Um, increased performance, and with all that can also lead secondarily, increased use of calories, increased development of um, the aesthetics that we're looking for, um, you know, a stronger stomach, stronger chest, uh, whatever those performance and those, those measured goals that we're looking for, with increased performance can come those increased body modification changes that we want to see. The muscular adaptations to resistance training, muscular growth, the hypertrophy, again, uh, due to the increase in the cross-sectional area, we won't get too much into that, but again, with resistance training, we see muscle growth. More muscle, greater resting metabolic rate, more efficient body. Um, again, increased uh, cross-sectional area positively is correlated with increased strength. So we see more of a CSA, we see greater increases in strength, greater use and greater uh, um, abilities to actually lift and move through space. Hyperplasia, which is considered an increase in muscle fibers. Uh, the muscle, muscle fiber changes and the transitions um, going from type 1 to type 2X, and that is moving from left to right, so 1 to 1C to 2C. Um, you've heard of slow twitch fibers and fast twitch fibers. Slow twitch fibers are located more on the left of this chart, so 1, 1C, 2C, and then fast twitch fibers get to the 2AX, 2X. So um, the more we resistance train, the more our muscle fibers change from slow twitch to fast twitch. Um, the more aerobic, the more cardiovascular workouts we do, the more they tend to change um, more in, in amount, I should say, uh, from type 2 to type 1. There usually is very little transition saying you're going to go from this type fiber. There just ends up being more of one of type fibers than the other. So we do want to see that with resistance training, we will see more of the type fibers, the type 2A, type 2AX, type 2X fibers being utilized. Um, structural and architectural changes, so again, as we resistance train, we can actually slowly change posture. For a lot of people who have poor posture, who sit a lot, um, who may feel sluggish when they get up or in pain, resistance training can help those small changes. Um, so we actually have that ability to maintain posture, maintain that spinal um, ability to maintain erect and 
from that core area, we can actually develop you know, less pain, um, greater ease of movement through space. Uh, resistance training increases myofibrillar volume, cytoplasmic density, um, T-tubes. So all these things are actually located in the cell, and all of these things help with increased resistance training, increased musculature, um, increased benefits to the body composition that we're looking for. And just a little thing, uh, there's actually been some research lately that's been happening out of um, southern Florida schools that sprint training, so for people who are healthy enough to do sprint training, um, they have seen a lot of benefits to people who don't necessarily want to do long-term cardio training can do concurrent sprint training, um, and they're seeing uh, solid fat mass loss in those people who are doing the sprint training rather than just long-term cardio. So um, for those of you interested, I, I do recommend looking at some of these studies to look at sprint um, training uh, versus long, long endurance cardio training. <clears throat> Endocrine responses, so these are quick anabolic responses. So we, when we resistance train, we can see and feel those changes occurring during and a little bit after. Um, elevated levels of testosterone and, gro and growth hormone. Growth hormone actually increases the most during, or during resistance training. Anywhere between two to five hundred percent increase in growth hormone um, during the lift and can stay up there again for 15-30 minutes after the training. Um, so there's that 30 minute people say window of opportunity, but that just means that in that you know 15 to 30 minutes after the training, those levels still stay high. Uh, the magnitude of the response usually greatest when the largest muscle masses are being performed. So if we're doing single arm bicep curls, they're relatively small arms. Yes, they still need to be worked, but doing them maybe in pull-ups or looking at rather than just doing a, a chest fly, we look at push-ups or chest press. Having more muscle actually being utilized, we see the greatest magnitude of these positive changes. Uh, chronic changes um, in the hormonal responses are more long-term, so more acute changes help with looking at a greater chronic long-term change. Um, and the chronic saturated levels, again, can also lead to desensitized receptors. We won't get too much into that, but the, the takeaway from this is resistance training does help increase the response to testosterone, which is necessary uh, for men and women for consistent growth, growth hormone and all of its variants, and even cortisol as well. Um, resistance training does have a, a crucial effect on the growth and the essentially product of that musculature over a long period of time. And like I said earlier about cardiovascular responses to resistance training, they, we have seen more and more studies that resistance training can have either a very little effect, no effect, or a slight increase in cardiovascular abilities. Um, so for a lot of people who may not get the opportunity to do a lot of cardiovascular training, uh, running, jogging, those kind of things, um, they can see some positive changes if they're just doing resistance training. That doesn't mean we want to not do cardio, but it does show that there is some acute effects with resistance training on the ability to perform longer, harder cardiovascular training sessions. So heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, blood pressure, they, these will all increase during resistance training. For the majority of healthy people, these are okay. For people who may um, have chronic you know, high blood pressure or have family um, known heart disease, these are things you will want to consult with a doctor and your physician before you actually perform a resistance training session. But for the healthy, normal adult, um, these are all normal responses. Um, the, contra the muscular contractions, uh, about 20% of maximal voluntary contraction impede blood flow during a set. So that's just basically saying um, as you are performing a muscular movement, um, the, the blood can be uh, blocked off um, 
from specific areas being utilized. Again, we're looking at healthy adults across the board. We're not talking about um, you know high risk disease um, board. We are just considering at a normal healthy adult that these things are not problematic. Um, chronic adaptations at rest, a small decrease in resting heart rate. So for people who tend to have a, a high heart rate at rest, looking over long-term resistance training, we may see a reduction in that resting heart rate. Um, again, a good thing, too high of a heart rate can also signify that there may be some disease or, or risk of disease. If we can decrease resting heart rate, we can tend to see sometimes um, a reduction in those risks and reduction in the, the morbidity of those diseases. Uh, blood pressure may decrease slightly or may not change at all. Um, but again, these are simple things that we can see. We, all, we always see the commercials for if you take this drug it works best with a diet and exercise program. Um, so basically saying, and a diet and exercise program will help no matter what. Um, blood pressure, again, can decrease uh, with good resistance training. So for some of us who have high blood pressure, do, following you know, basic ACSM guidelines, like what we said before, as a starting base can potentially help see those decreases that may be necessary, especially if your doctor is telling you you need to decrease your blood pressure um, even before maybe you start looking at um, other ways where the drugs have to come into play. Um, some people can stave off those just by maintaining an exercise regimen. Um, and heavy resistance training Unfortunately, you know, it does little to enhance the resting cardiac function. So we're, you know, talking about cardiac output, um, but we either see no change in some of these or a positive change. Rarely do we see a negative change in anything with resistance training, uh, metabolically or cardiovascularly. So it can it can either help you or it's not. Rarely is it going to harm you if we're doing it correctly and we're normal, healthy adults. So here are just some studies I want to go over as to why we resistance train, and then we're going to get into kind of eating for resistance training, because we talked about last time about cardiovascular, and there are some changes. So these just mean that there will be some changes each day how you eat, um, based on if you're doing a heavier cardio session or a heavier resistance training session. So I've had this study up, I believe, last time and potentially another time, but it begs to speak about it again. Um, this was published in the International Journal of Sports Nutrition, Exercise, and Metabolism in 2006, and it does show, if you look at the graph with the black circles, that is the control group. So that group received nothing. We just, they were just followed over the course of time. The uh, white square box, you can see, followed a trend of a decrease, and that was a cardiovascular uh, workout with a traditional diet. So basically a higher, car a higher carbohydrate, higher fat, lower protein, typical American diet. Um, but with the cardio training, they did see a decrease in body weight in kilograms. So about a 3.4% decrease in body weight by doing cardio and, and eating a, a traditional diet. But then if you look at the triangle line, this is resistance training, cardiovascular training, and a balanced diet, so a balanced diet being more um, looking at the individual saying, okay, we're going to increase resistance training, so we need to have a little bit more protein, cardio maybe working on where the carbs and, and uh, fat lie on that scale and maybe being more approximate to what is actually necessary rather than just eating and eating and not actually taking into account how much. With using resistance training and cardio, and a proper balanced diet that was tailored a little bit more towards the individual, we saw a greater decrease in weight. So just by also by consuming that resistance training, those people also saw a greater decrease, um, roughly 6.2%, uh, almost 3% more than the previous group, um, just by changing the diet just a little bit and by adding resistance training to that program. Um, so. So for people who are saying, well, cardio is the best way, I would personally say no. All three are the best way. Resistance training, cardio, and a, and a change in the diet, you will, the potential to see the greatest effect is there. 
Um, these two studies are talking strictly about the difference between resistance training and aerobic training. Um, this one study that was done uh, showed the effects of resistance training, so you know R plus D, the resistance group, um, versus the control group, aerobic training, um, and a very low calorie diet, approximately 800 calories, um, which I wouldn't recommend for anybody who's a normal healthy adult working out, exercising with the normal um, activities of daily living. That is extremely low um, and can lead to chronic issues later on where it's very difficult to stay on that low of a diet. Um, so the, the objective of this study was to see if the VLCD, the very low calorie diet for weight loss, resulted in loss of lean body weight, so muscle, um, and a decrease in resting metabolic rate, so RMR. So things that we don't want to see. We don't want to see a loss of muscle. We don't want to see a decrease in resting metabolic rate. Adding aerobic exercise, and then the purpose was to examine the effect of um, intensive high volume resistance training with a very low calorie diet to see. So the, they had 17 women, three men, rough age, about 38 years old across the board, and they split them up into two groups, so n equals 10, which means sample size. Um, so the control group was 800 calorie liquid diet, one hour, four times a week of either walking, biking, or stair climbing, and it lasted approximately 12 weeks. So four times a week, this group for 12 weeks would get together for one hour and perform one of those three um, cardio vascular workouts, walking, biking, or stair climbing. The resistance group, also 10 people, consuming the same 800 liquid, calorie liquid diet, would resistance train just three times a week, um, using 10 stations essentially for the whole body, so each exercise at one, you know, each station of the 10 stations may be a major body part. Um, and then increasing from two sets of 8 to 15 reps, depending on what that person could do, through the 12 weeks to four sets of 8 to 15 reps. So they would start in the first few weeks at two sets of 8 to 15 reps for each station, and then slowly as the 12 weeks occurred, they would increase to four sets of 8 to 15 reps. So a progressive 12-week um, program of resistance training increasing the sets, um, still consuming the 100 calorie diet. Results, VO2 max, so essentially how much oxygen you can take in and utilize, increased in both groups. Um, didn't say necessarily how much in one or the other, but the VO2 actually increased in both, people who just resistance train and people who did just cardio. The control plus diet group, so the cardio group, they lost roughly 28 pounds of fat but they also lost about nine pounds of muscle, and that is a, a great loss. So that's approximately a 37 pounds loss total, and they decreased their resting metabolic rate by about 210 calories. Um, so again, that decrease in resting metabolic rate probably was influenced heavily by that loss of nine pounds of muscle, because we know lean body mass has a large effect on resting metabolic rate. So when we lose muscle, our ability to be as efficient is decreased. Um, yes, they did lose 28.2 pounds of fat, but they also lost a great percentage of muscle with that. The resistance plus diet group, so the people who worked out three times a week, lifted three times a week, lost approximately 32 pounds of fat, but only lost about 1.8 pounds of muscle, which was not considered significant. And they actually increased their resting metabolic rate by 63 calories. So not only did they preserve essentially almost all of their muscle, they also lost more fat, and they increased their resting metabolic rate. Three things which are very difficult to do for the normal person, but this group using that specifically low calorie diet and that training program saw all three positive improvements. Decrease in fat, essential main maintenance of their muscle that they had over the 12 weeks, and increased resting metabolic rate. Uh, the conclusion to this study, uh, the addition of an intensive high volume resistance training program resulted in the preservation of lean body weight, muscle, and resting metabolic rate during weight loss with a very low calorie diet. So these people were able to say, I can lose weight and maintain my muscle at the same time.
Um, if you do want to read more, you can. There's the link, or there's the uh, the location of the Journal of American College of Nutrition. Um, this is published in '99, and it's still considered a, a classic study to this day. This study showed the effects of strength or aerobic training on body comp, rest, RMR, and peak oxygen consumption, and these were using obese dieting subjects. So they wanted to see that if the resting metabolic rate and the fat-free mass muscle would change with aerobic or strength training, um, and also see hypertrophy and see if these things with dieting would be changed, if anything. So the method, uh, the re RCT, which is a randomized controlled trial, moderately obese subjects between 19 to 48 years old, and they had 25 men and 40 women, so 65 people total. Their diet was a formula, essentially a liquid diet, where everybody was given their RMR, found their RMR through testing, and they, their diet was 70% of that RMR. So potentially more calories than the previous eight, uh, diet of 800 that we saw in the previous study. Um, not saying that they were, but at 70% RMR, more than likely, they were looking at more calories they were consuming than 800. Um, three groups, diet only group, diet plus resistance training, so they would resistance train again three times a week, um, going from upper and lower body progressive weight resistance exercises, and then diet plus cardiovascular three times a week as well, and they would alternate leg and arm cycling workouts. And this only lasted eight weeks compared to the previous study of 12 weeks. The results uh, across the board among the three groups, there was approximately about nine kilogram loss, um, a very small change between them, um, a difference between them, I should say. But overall, essentially, there was about a nine kilogram weight loss amongst all three groups. The diet plus resistance training, they lost, again, the least amount of fat-free mass. So they lost the least amount of muscle, about 1.1 kilograms. Um, so again, the diet and the resistance training with a reduced calorie intake meant that they would lose weight. Um, and some of that would be expected had they not done resistance training, the lean body mass, muscle. But the resistance training prevented that extreme loss of fat-free mass, aka muscle, and only about approximately 1.1 kilograms lost. The diet plus cardiovascular, they lost approximately 20 percent fat-free mass, about 2.3 kilograms, and then the diet only lay lost approximately 28 percent of their fat-free mass, or about 2.8 kilograms. So the resistance training, hands down, won it with the least amount lost. In this study, they did see a mean RMR decline among all three groups. So if you notice the previous study, the RMR increased with resistance training. In this study, the RMR decreased. So again, to say that rest, uh, resistance training will increase resting metabolic rate, that may not necessarily be true, depending on the calorie intake as well. Um, the conclusion, again, like I said earlier, the strength training significantly reduced the loss of the fat-free mass and aided weight loss during the dieting. This study did not prevent the decline in the resting metabolic rate like the last study did. So there are some changes uh, depending on the people that were in the study, the methodology, whether they considered something intense or not intense. So um, I do encourage you to look at some of these studies. They are available to look at. Um, but again, this shows you the basic outline of Resistance training helps prevent muscle loss, and with a proper diet, we can see that muscle being maintained and weight loss, potentially at the same time. So now that we've seen lean body mass, muscle can remain relatively stable. You know, there may be a slight decrease, but overall we see very, you know, almost no significant change while losing weight, and a lot of these people lost significant weight, um, we can see the change in BMI. So for a lot of us who use BMI as our indicators, or when we go to a doctor, the doctor tells us our BMI, chances are our height isn't changing, so our weight is going to be changing. Um, so we will potentially see those changes in BMI, hopefully for the better. Um, and now we can maintain or increase relative strength the muscle mass, the percentage muscle mass that we have compared to the percentage fat and or the power that we're able to produce with that muscle mass. 
how do we relate this to what we eat? <clears throat> so for some of us, we automatically think, well, if I'm resistance training, I just need a lot of protein and almost no carbs. Well, that's not technically true. So a, there, this was done, um, International Journal, again, Sports Nutrition. Um, this was a six-week low-carb diet on anaerobic exercise. So they did a Wingate test, which was a kind of a power test on a, on a stationary bike, seeing the power output somebody could put through on the bike um, within about 30 seconds, how hard they can pedal out. And the mean power, which means average, and the peak, which means how hard they could go at, the, at their heaviest, at their hardest. Um, in the 55% carbohydrate group, so this group, they consumed, their diet was 55% carbohydrates mixed with um, some other amounts of protein and fat, and then a group at 8% carbohydrates. That means the other 92% were of protein and fat. And you can see that the people who ate the 55% carbohydrates, so more than half of their daily intake was carbs, were able to maintain a higher mean power output. The people who are on the very low carbohydrate diet saw a 20% decrease um, in that mean power, so their average power across the board. If you look at peak power, being on the 55% carbohydrate diet, they were able to put out the highest power at about 900, and then the peak power could uh, for the low carb 8% carbohydrate diet could only put out about 800, so um, about 100 watts less. So across the board, they performed worse and potentially um, in less time than the higher carbohydrate diet. And I'll get into a little bit more as to why we want to look at carbohydrates as well for those uh, positive body changes. So improvement in body composition and keto adaptation, you know, people looking at um, higher fat diets and resistance training. They're across the board, this was done by Volick and Strength and Conditioning uh, Journal. And people who consumed, and this is a change in percent body fat over 12 weeks, people who consumed a low fat diet lost approximately 2%. Um, People who consumed a lower carb diet lost approximately 3.4% body fat. Um, we are seeing more research and we're, we're all getting more familiar with it's not the fat that potentially makes us fat, it's the overconsumption of carbohydrates that we don't utilize that get stored as fat. Um, so lower carbohydrates um, potentially see that reduction in body fat, which reflected potentially those two studies I showed you with those very low uh, calorie diets. Um, a low fat plus resistance training saw a slight greater decrease, about 3.5%, um, just about a tenth more than just the low carb, but definitely greater than just the low fat. But then the low carb plus resistance training saw a huge decrease in change of body fat. Um, so for people who were on this 12-week program, the people who saw the best result in fat percentage decrease were on a lower carbohydrate diet and increased resistance training. The one, the things you need to know, though, um, which I was alluding to, was low carbohydrate diets do help reduce body weight. Um, low carbohydrate diet, you know, keeping a low carbohydrate diet does help with removing some of that water weight. It does if we consume low carb carbohydrate diet, we tend to also potentially consume just less calories overall because the majority of our diet does come from, uh, from carbohydrates. But low-carbohydrate diets can also help reduce performance. And for some of us, we may think, well, I don't really care. I'm not really into performance. But in the long run, we should be because with a decrease in performance, we get on a treadmill, we try to do weight one day, and then the next day we've been on a low-carb diet, we may not feel as good, and we may not feel that we can push the same weight, but then we try to because we don't want to regress from where we were the week before or the day before, um, which if we're trying to do something we, don't, we can't do, this increases the risk of injury and potentially overtraining, which means we would be out uh, from working out for, for quite a while because with the injury means recuperation and overtraining means reduction in a lot of these positive changes we're seeing. Um, 
reduction in performance can also lead to a reduced calorie expenditure. So somebody who can perform longer, harder, faster, better can utilize more calories. Somebody who performs um, in a lot less time with a lot less intensity, a lot less duration will probably re utilize a lot less calories. So if we reduce the calorie expenditure over a longer period of time because of that reduced performance, there is a possibility for that decrease in the rate of weight loss. And this is sometimes where we see people say, I've plateaued, I can't see the weight loss that I saw before. Well, that's because performance may have suffered. We can't go as hard or as long or take those opportunities to challenge ourselves and then the rate of weight loss decreases and then we see that we're in that stuck position and things have to change. And the only way to change that is either reduce what we're doing or change our diet. And then we can also see a reduced, rest, uh, reduced resting metabolic rate, again potentially because of overtraining, the risk of injury, um, the, the rapid weight loss at the beginning, and the resting metabolic rate, as we know, the higher the resting metabolic rate, the more efficient our body is, usually the more muscle that we have. So if we have a reduced resting metabolic rate, the less efficient our body is becoming, which again will lead to potentially reduced performance and all the increase in injury and the reduced calorie expenditure. So it all comes back in a circle to us. So we do want to look at performance. Can we go just a little bit harder? Can we go just a little bit longer? Can we do it just a little bit better? Will that utilize potentially more calories where I can see those body composition changes that I'm looking for? The goals must be a priority rather than just the immediate tangible results. And when I say tangible, I'm talking about you step on a scale and you see the needle go from a three to a two. Um, you know, being able to just see those changes that may not actually result in a healthier body. We do want to look at the long-term effects. Am I actually being able to lift heavier, lift longer, lift more safely, run longer, run harder, uh, run more safely? Um, am I seeing those positive body compositional changes that I want to see over that longer period of time, and can I maintain this with this proper diet? Um, athletes and protein, I think this deserves to be mentioned that with resistance training, we do want to see an increase in protein because we do break down the musculature when we resistance train, and the way to resynthesize those muscles, make them stronger, make them better, is an increase in protein. Um, so how much, though, is the question from a lot of people. Um, do I have to consume it immediately after? Do I have to consume it uh, three to four times as much as I normally do? Is there an amount that I can only consume this much in one meal, otherwise I'm just going to waste it? And a lot of those questions are all valid. And what I can say is protein synthesis um, will happen up to 48 hours after resistance training. So if, depending on how hard you go, if you are looking at, if you're doing a, a very hard, intense resistance training workout, 48 hours after that workout, protein synthesis can still occur. So that means you have 48 hours to get high quality protein in your diet um, to help uh, revitalize those muscle tissues, help uh, reinfuse those muscles with the proper nutrients that are necessary for them to grow, for them to develop, for them to become more powerful and stronger. Um, athletes, and you know, I, I use athletes in a general term, athletes, you know, somebody who's a professional football player to just a recreational person who likes to come in and work out three to four days a week, um, do require a higher amount of protein. The recommended amount of protein, the RDA right now, is about 0.8 grams per kilogram. Uh, we do recommend anywhere between as low as 1.2 to up to like 1.7 um, kilograms and some people even 2.0 grams per kilogram to see those positive changes in musculature and muscle strength and size. Um, this just means that the calories will have to change where if we're going to increase protein we may have to see a small increase in calories or take that increase and, re and reduce something else, carbohydrates or fats depending on what our diet needs and our goal needs are. 
protein choices are very crucial. Um, essential amino acids, if you look to the top right, are branch chain amino acids um, and some of these other ones listed. The quality is determined by the essential amino acid content, so those amino acids in the top right, um, the more of those proteins that are in, uh, the, the more of those amino acids that are in the protein, the greater the quality. So we consider complete proteins are usually animal-based proteins, uh, dairy, eggs, fish, meats, those kind of things, and incompletes are usually coming from more vegetables and fruits and grains. But combining them is one way to make a complete protein. For example, um, beans mixed with corn, beans have are missing a few of these essential amino acids where corn actually has some of the missing um, amino acids that the beans don't have. So combining them, combining these complementary proteins, which are plant-based, can create a complete protein. So for those of you who are vegetarians and vegans, you don't have to necessarily be too concerned about only getting complete proteins from animal sources. You can combine a lot of these vegetables and fruits and grains to get complete source proteins. Uh, supplements, so like whey, casein, milk, and egg proteins are usually considered the best because they have the, um, the quickest active ability to be absorbed and utilized. Um, back to absorption, um, complete proteins before and after exercise is key. So usually people used to say protein has to be done at the end. We're seeing more and more research come out that's saying protein throughout the day is definitely more important. So if you're getting that 1.5, uh, 1.7 grams per kilogram of protein throughout the day um, and being able to maintain that throughout the day, you will see greater changes in your musculature um, rather than just saying, I need to consume all this protein right after or right before the workout. Um, whey protein is faster in absorption uh, sense than casein, um, but we do see about the same um, increase in protein synthesis. So for those looking to get it quickly into their system, whey would be better, but for those of us who aren't really concerned or don't want to spend the money on whey, you know, drinking uh, about a glass or two of milk um, does provide those necessarily necessary proteins for protein synthesis and muscle growth. Um, Pre-event meal, and this doesn't, the event doesn't necessarily have to be a marathon or a triathlon or a power meet. It can be a basic solid resistance training workout one hour here or going for a nice long run or doing Tabata or HIIT training, something where you're planning on doing a, a solid workout that you're going to come by and say, um, you know, I, I push my body to a good limit. Three to six hours prior to whatever that event is, you do want to consider actually taking in carbohydrates because we utilize carbohydrates as fuel almost immediately in a workout, um, whether that is a slow run or a quick sprint. Carbohydrates will be utilized. We'll utilize ATP first, and then when that gets utilized after the first few seconds, we move into carbohydrates and uh, glycogen breakdown. And so carbohydrates are absolutely necessary for the performance of that whatever that workout or whatever that event is. About one hour prior, which makes more sense to some of us, since some of us aren't doing triathlons or doing these long endurance events. So one hour prior to maybe your regular workout, you do want to look at um, uh, a carbohydrate supplement or meal with some protein in it. And usually the basis is about 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates um, about one hour before the workout. So 30 to 60 carbohydrates could be, you know, a sandwich um, with a large piece of fruit, like a large banana, two slices of bread with large banana, and then maybe some turkey and cheese on it. That would be a solid 30 to 60 gram carbohydrate. And some of us need a little bit less, some of us need a little bit more depending on how hard we plan on going. But a little bit of protein, again, helps with that protein synthesis, the protein built, uh, um, building in the muscles, and the carbohydrates give us that necessary fuel when we do start the workout. 
And some of us need a blended or liquid meal, so kind of like a uh, fruit smoothie with some protein in it. Um, or some of us like to eat uh, solid foods. It really just depends on what your stomach and what you're able to actually consume at that time. Um, performance, again, doesn't seem to be altered when we consume carbohydrates before and a little bit of protein. But again, we do want to be considerate of some of us have greater GI problems. So if you know eating a solid meal before a workout isn't going to be good for you, try consuming a liquid meal, a liquid supplement beforehand and play around with it. See what works for you better. But 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates an hour before the workout, 5 to 10 grams of protein is a solid way to start because those carbohydrates will be utilized for the workout, and hopefully with those carbohydrates, you can go just a little bit harder, a little bit longer, um, and burn the necessary calories, build the necessary muscle um, that is that you want to see those long-term effects. Uh, Dr. Ivy in 2003 um, did nine trained male cyclists, and they exercised for about three hours at varying intensities. So this is like a long workout from on in most standards. They did 45 to 75% of the VO2, and then um, they would immediately go into essentially like a, almost a sprint at 85% of VO2 until fatigue. Uh, during the three hours, they consumed every 20 minutes either a carb and protein supplement, just a carb supplement, or a placebo. And this is what was found. The time to exhaustion, the carb and protein group, saw the greatest time to exhaustion. That means they could go harder, they could go longer. The carbohydrate group was about the middle. Um, they only went about 17 to 18 minutes, about 19 minutes. Um, but the carb protein group was able to go about 25, 26 minutes. And the placebo group was only able to go about 11 minutes um, time to exhaustion. So you can see that during the workout, again, this is a long workout, so it's necessary to get these calories in. The carb and protein group, could go longer, could go harder, which means they could expend more energy and more calories by being able to perform better. Uh, Post-exercise nutrition, like I said earlier, if people hear about that 30-minute window. If you don't use it, you lose it. Um, essentially, we have about 24 hours to fully replenish muscle glycogen stores, so essentially the muscle glucose that we utilize for workouts. Um, a little bit during resistance training, a lot during aerobic training, HIIT training, those kind of things, uh, circuit training as well. Um, 15 to 30 minutes post-exercise, we want to see some type of fluid, some type of consumption of carbohydrates. And usually what's recommended is about 1 to 1 1.5 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram right after the workout. And this will help replenish the glycogen stores. Adding protein to this carbohydrate uh, mix, drink, food, whatever, again, will help with the protein synthesis, which we want to see. Um, so again, for somebody who's maybe 65 kilograms, 65 grams of carbohydrates um, can actually help replenish those glycogen stores quicker. So the next day, we may be able to go again during a workout without feeling sluggish, without feeling that we haven't replenished those, that stored energy yet. The key word for post-exercise is recovery. Um, recovery is absolutely crucial during any workout period. Um, all, the more and more research that is coming out, the more and more that is showing that Post-workout nutrition is absolutely essential, and this goes for the most elite of elite long-distance runners to the recreational YMCA basketball person athlete. Um, a post-workout nutrition is absolutely essential, and that should include carbohydrates and proteins. And one of the questions I get from a lot of people is, well, how much protein needs to be taken right after um, a workout? There's been a lot of research that is showing uh, approximately 20 to 25 grams of protein after a workout is enough that it'll help meet that protein synthesis level. Um, and that's 25 to 25 grams of complete proteins with those essential amino acids in it. So for, an exa for example, a two 
um, cups of chocolate milk, um, whether you mix it yourself or it's a uh, pre-mixed chocolate milk, provides approximately 16 to 20 grams. And then a scoop of protein powder can apply that extra grams of protein. Um, and a banana um, with um, any type, you know, or jelly, uh, half a bagel with jelly, those kind of post-workout nutrition guidelines, very simple to take in, very easy to take in, can supply the necessary nutrients for the recovery, which is crucial, so we can, again, perform better the next time. Um, the strength and endurance, so again, I use athlete for anybody who is working out for performance for goals. Beware of the depleted glycogen stores. You know, we don't know if we're depleted in glycogen without actually doing like um, intramuscular testing and blood testing. So it's best that we just say, well, I don't want to be in a depleted glycogen store. I will replenish my carbohydrates as necessary so I can perform again the next day. Um, increased protein breakdown. So if we're not consuming enough protein in our diet and for the, us who work out, on a regular basis, we do want to see you know, about 1.2 grams to 1.7 grams per kilogram of protein consumed per day. And that negative muscle protein balance. So if we're always in that protein breakdown mode, our body is always breaking down the protein, our muscles, to maintain a balance. And if we're always breaking down our muscle, even during the recovery phase, we'll never be able to reach those performance goals, those weight loss goals, those strength goals. So we always want to be in a positive muscle protein balance, having enough protein in our, in our body that we've consumed so we don't utilize our muscles uh, to break down for energy. We can use the calories and the protein that we consumed for energy and for the growth and building of that musculature. Um, failure, again, to bring the body to the recovery level and then past it where we uh, supra-recover, we do see prolonged muscle soreness. So for, so for some of us, we say, oh, I'm still sore. Well, potentially, it's either we've gone too hard for too long, the fatigue, depleted glycogen stores so we don't have the necessary stored energy, or the muscle has not recovered yet because we haven't supplied it with the necessary protein and nutrients. Um, Overtraining, consistently working out without the proper recovery methods of sleep, fluid, um, increased risk of injury, decreased energy consumption and micro and macronutrient consumption. Um, and this also, again, leads to minimal gains in the muscle mass, the lean body mass, the decrease in fat mass, um, no matter how well a training program. You could have the best training program from the best trainer, and if we are consistently not meeting our muscle protein needs, meeting those glycogen stores, meeting those fluid needs, it does not matter. We will never see those positive changes that we want to see. And for some of us, for some of us who want to run harder, run longer, lift heavier, we will see that negative and poor athletic performance. Uh, the post-exercise nutrient intake, again, this is looking at immediate and three hours after. Um, so the bright white immediately after nutrient intake, uh, the glucose uptake, glycogen storage, amino acid uptake, protein synthesis, net protein balance, immediately after we all see increases. Three hours after, they're still increased, but not as high as immediately after. So for some of us, it's best that we consume those necessary carbohydrates and proteins after the workout where we have the greatest immediate response to them. For some of us who can't get that in, we may not see that great response that we could immediately after, but again, you can still see that there is a positive response um, for protein synthesis, amino acid uptake, glycogen stores, and glucose three hours after um, the exercise to get those nutrients in. Um, the post-exercise recovery, again, we want to see its moderate to high glycemic index carbohydrates um, immediately after. One gram 
of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight is what we're looking for. Some of us may need more, but a good starting place is that one gram per uh, kilogram. Enhanced protein synthesis, so getting that 20 to 25 grams in of protein, a complete amino acid protein um, immediately after the workout will help with that protein synthesis that is necessary. Um, and for some of us, being able to add the fruit or honey um, to a protein shake will help with adding those carbohydrates that are necessary and the protein for the protein synthesis. Um, 0.5 to 1 gram per kilogram per hour, which, you know, if you, if you do the math, will come to about 1.2, 1.7 across the board. Um, there is a ratio that some people say, a 3 to uh, 4 to 1 ratio of carbs to protein in a recovery meal. So, for example, for every, if you had 25 grams of protein in there, you should have about 75 to 100 grams of carbohydrates in that post meal. And fluid and electrolyte replacements need to be there. Uh, for some of us who go very hard, um, we lose electrolytes in the sweat, but we should be consuming fluids throughout the day and definitely consuming enough fluids to maintain that loss. So if we lost about you know, a pound during the workout, we can bet that almost all of that was, or most of it was from fluids. So we should consider consuming about 16 ounces of fluid to replenish the ones that we lost. And again, it's always important is the recovery and preparing yourself for that next workout, race, event, whatever that is. So you again, you can see that increase in performance and increase in those changes and getting closer to those goals. Uh, the maintenance phase we won't go over, but this is pretty much for people who are after the workout, so the 23 hours after that one hour workout, um, you're looking to maintain the glycemic index, more lower glycemic index carbohydrates, about two to three hours with protein at every meal, um, leaner proteins, whole grains, legumes, so just basically a very balanced, very uh, variable diet with good protein, lean proteins, lower glycemic grains, nuts, berries, fruits, and vegetables across the board to get those nutrients that are necessary for that recovery period. And here's a quick breakdown of just a very few foods that you can consider what low glycemic is, moderate glycemic, so low glycemic usually um, anywhere less than about 25 or 30, moderate maybe between like 30 to 60 and then higher around like you know 60, 70 and, and higher. Um, and you can definitely see the differences from cookies and candies being a higher glycemic food to a lower glycemic of legumes, steel-cut oats. And again, this list is absolutely not um, absolute. There are millions of other foods on, that can be put on this list. Fluid needs, being able to get the necessary fluids, 9 to 13 cups a day um, on average for women and men. But for people who are working out, that you may need more. And the, the best advice is however much fluid you lose during a workout, you should consume about 150% of that. So if you lose a pound of weight during a workout, so you went from 140, 150 pounds to 149 pounds, that's about 16 ounces, you should consume about 24 ounces. So that would be 150% more. So about 24 ounces of fluid to recuperate. Um, the water helps dissipate heat, it helps with fluidity of the muscles, it helps transfer, it helps with blood volume, um, helps prevent exhaustion, especially if we're working outside. Um, so getting those necessary fluids in throughout the day is absolutely crucial to maintain homeostatic levels. So in summary, increasing the protein intake from about 1.2 to 1.7 grams um, some of us consume about 0.8, the RDA. We do want to see a, 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 maybe even a doubling of that amount of protein throughout the day. Um, but at least 1.2 to see those necessary changes in body composition and muscle mass. Um, keep fluid intake maintained throughout the day. So if you tend to consume a lot of fluids at one time or another, try to space it out if you can. But definitely try to consume that 150% after the workout. Um, a decreased carbohydrate intake diet, 
can uh, lead to a decrease in weight, but it can also lead to a decrease in performance, which could lead to then later on a decrease in that rate of weight loss where we plateau. So be careful um, maintaining a long, low carbohydrate diet. Resistance training has been proven to help with weight loss and fat mass loss um, and maintain strength and muscle even in low, carbo low energy diets um, in or together with the uh, weight loss and the fat mass loss. So again, resistance training with the uh, weight loss, help improve weight loss, help improve fat mass loss, help maintain strength um, and muscle even in low calorie diets. So we do want to see a greater in increase in resistance training from a lot of clientele because there's only just positive benefits to it. Um, and of course, we don't want to just say one or the other. We want to see a combination of resistance training with cardiovascular training um, for the maximum results. If we're looking for the greatest amount of weight loss, fat mass loss, muscle strength, and muscle gain, muscle hypertrophy, the best way to do it is, again, from that previous study, resistance training, cardio training, balanced diet, proper fluid intake. Uh, that is about it for today. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who attended in this. Um, you know, really appreciate you guys listening in. We'll be doing this again uh, come, I believe, April, and we'll be doing these for quite a few months. Um, expect to be seeing another post about the next topic. And if you have any questions, again, please feel free to send them in. I'll be glad to answer them. Um, hope you have a great rest of the evening and keep working hard towards those goals. Take care.